Hi everyone. Uh, I would like to introduce the uh, speaker for today's uh, Spark session, uh, Dr. Venki Venkateshwara. Uh, uh, Dr. Venki is Assistant Professor uh, in Economics uh, at Stern School of Business, uh, New York University. Uh, earlier, he was a faculty uh, with the Department of Economics uh, in Pennsylvania State University. Uh, he is also uh, an alumnus of Ahmedabad and he did, completed his uh, doctoral uh, studies in economics from uh, UCLA. Uh, we, are, we are very glad and uh, grateful that you uh, come here and uh, to speak on uh, leading uh, research on uh, development economics. And uh, so he has given us a challenge that uh, the person who would be asking most number of questions and really good questions would take the formula to life and everything in the economic development at the end. So, Please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank Sushelta, uh, and all of you for um, inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Let's do some most innovative and interesting work uh, in development and uh, speaking as an economist from a very different perspective. I think we that we can um, so, um, so I think speaking as, a, as an economist, a macroeconomist, you know, who looks many of these questions from uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat different perspective, uh, I think it's, um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here and in fact all of you. So here's the goal for the talk. Um, so I'm going to try and talk a little bit about um, research in macroeconomics, focusing on productivity in developing countries, and hence the title productivity. Um, so, macroeconomists have been theorizing, speculating about productivity for many, many years. But some of the most interesting stuff that's happened in the last maybe five, ten years is there's a lot of data that's available. So, we've been able to go much further in thinking about what is really happening. And I think some of the themes I'm going to talk about will bring home, uh, ring true to many of you who are probably dealing with those issues uh, on a daily basis. So I think that's what I'm going to try and talk about. So I'm going to talk about some big questions, uh, but most of my talk is going to be about very specific research papers that were written using very, very kind of very, very micro data. Uh, and so most of my talk is going to be about um, kind of large macro kind of questions. But then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about microfinance, uh, which is sort of topic near and dear to your heart. Um, but then see a little bit about um, see how much time. Okay, so that's the question. So what are we trying to do, and what do, you know, what do developing economists lose their uh, sleep about? Oh, I can't do this, okay. And so the, the big question, you know, uh, that all of us kind of obsess about, is this idea about why is there so much disparity in income across countries, right? And, you know, many, many ways of looking at this question, all of them seem to point to the idea that higher productivity is what explains uh, this differential. A little bit more specific about what I mean by productivity in a second, but that's the, that's that's why we are going to obsess about productivity uh, to the extent that we do. And then, so that then, it, in some sense, it's not going. It's not really an answer because all it's doing is shifting the question from, you know, why are some countries so much richer? To just asking the question, why is productivity so much higher than some countries? It just shifts the question in some way. Right, um, and then there, and that's where most of most of the research these days. So I think most economists kind of take this almost axiomatically as given. I mean, it's, there's no point arguing about the first question anymore. Uh, most of the action is to try and understand uh, the second part. Um, and then there are lots of theories and lots of this thing, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, for most of the thing today. And then at the end, we'll speculate, and hopefully, you know, come up with some bright ideas on how we can face these problems. The goal of trying to do this, of trying to understand what really drives this, is precisely for that last question. So that we can actually ask ourselves, okay, is this something we can fix? Is this something that policy, regulation, intervention, whatever, uh, can actually do something about? And I think that's the, that's the perspective uh, from which we're going to look at some of these things. Okay, so that's what I'm going to try. Okay, um, so I'm going to first very quickly, you know, uh, deal with that first part. So this is the picture. I use this in my classes. Everybody has seen some version of this. This is GDP per capita. 
for the last, or you know, the last millennium in a bunch of different regions of the world. Some of these numbers are harder to get estimated and in very rough ways and very indirectly. So the numbers themselves are kind of somewhat suspect, but the patterns are unmistakable. And I think any way you do it, kind of the same thing. As somebody, one of my colleagues, described it for a long time. For a long time, we were all poor. The good thing was we all died off very quickly. And then somewhere along the way, things started to change. Uh, and that breaking point is somewhere along the 1800s, is roughly the industrial revolution. Again, but the fascinating thing is that industrial revolution did not hit the entire world at the same time. A bunch of countries just took off, uh, and the next 200 years experienced kind of almost incredible uh, you know, improvements in, 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 um, in income levels and standards of living. Other countries lag behind. Some countries, uh, like Japan is a good example, really did not have a very late start, but seem to have caught up. Other countries, like India and China, are only now beginning to catch up. Countries like Africa, or countries in Africa, are, you know, are still lagging significantly. So a lot of energy made, but this is the picture that we try to understand. This is the pattern we want to try to understand. What explains, starting from what looked like very, very similar conditions, what explains this kind of wide deviation in our right. So here's the, the, the canonical way of doing this. Um, in, um, for those of you who have taken macroeconomics classes, you've seen something like this. The simple idea is to say, let's relate total output of GDP to, uh, to inputs. K is capital, L is labor, and whatever is left is in this term A. So we measure K and L. There are issues with measurement, but we can do the best we can. We measure the physical inputs into production, capital, and labor, and whatever is left, or whatever cannot be explained by the inputs, is what we're going to call right. So it's kind of like a catch-all thing. It reflects technology. It reflects all kinds of things uh, that, govern, that govern this map, that change the mapping from inputs to outputs. Right? And that's what this, uh, but why do we do this? We do this because we want to try and see, so, you know, the, the, the example I give in my class is that Y in the US is 70 times the Y in Burundi, right? And we want to understand, is the Y in the US higher because K in the US is higher? So uh, I must be, I must be careful about this. What I'm interested in is Y over X. So I'm interested in per capita. So it's not about populations, it's just about per capita. So is the Y in the US so much higher? Because the US worker has a lot of capital that's working for him, or is it because he has a higher pay? Right? And so capital is not unimportant, but I think you know this calculation has been done many ways, in many, many different ways, all of which basically points to this TFP as the most this A term as the most important one. Right? So that's the sense, that's the that's what has led to this consensus uh, over time. And it's for, for a while this is a big debate. Uh, back in the 70s, when the East Asian economies were growing, the big debate was, oh, are they just kind of growing, you know, can it, are they just experiencing growth because of A? Because you just, they're opening up, they get a ton of capital, there's a lot of investment, there's a lot of production as a result of that, and then you experience it. But I think over time, that debate has been resolved, again, by data, uh, that if you're really looking at long-run outcomes, the only way to get those long-run outcomes uh, look somewhat like this picture, like the, the red uh, figures in this picture, is to get A to go up. And I think if you look at India and China during their growth years, that's exactly what you see. Yeah, there's a lot of capital, that's great, but it's really the A that's doing the work, even in countries like India and China. Right, so that's what we're going to start thinking about. Oops, sorry. Okay? So that's what we're going to think about. Why does A be so much? Okay? So the first and the most kind of, you know, Simple explanation is that A is something like technology. Right? A is literally what is the technology I'm using to transform uh, my inputs into output. That doesn't go very far. Because the reason it doesn't go very far is because people have looked at the, 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 the example of being Denver earlier, is people look at something like agriculture. Right? They do exactly the, the technological difference is really, really small. It's exactly the same process, and yet the A is B. So, you know, the stylized fact is we think the A in, in manufacturing is X. The, the, the difference in A in manufacturing is X, 
The difference in A in agricultural is five months. So it's really much, so it's, it's, cannot, it's something which cannot really be explained by simple technological differences. It's something like efficiency, which is a different object than technology. That's, that's the first and the most natural interpretation. So that's what people have been, so that's the first thought. The first thought is what's called loosely speaking management. In other words, you know, higher A means that I'm able to produce more output with the same input. And the question is, maybe I'm managing the production process better. Maybe I'm doing something differently uh, with those inputs. The same technology, everything is the same, but I'm able to do things better because I'm, I'm a better manager of the production process. Right? So that's the first uh, theory. And again, you know, business schools are full of case studies of doing things better. There's tons and tons and tons of case studies. But no real kind of, uh, kind of empirical analysis. In other words, suppose I took one sector, as I'm going to do in a second, uh, the textile manufacturing sector in India, or pick any sector, and say, is the difference in A between India and another competing country because of better management? That's the kind of empirical analysis that's never been done. Partly because the data never exists at the level of industry, far less low at the level. So there's a lot of speculation, you know. At the NBA, I mean, I have, you know, would say, oh, no, no, banking is where all the action is. Always, you always have that. And that's what, so Cyberson is a professor in Chicago and one of the, you know, one of the leading um, experts in this field. So he, he wrote a very nice article. Uh, he talks about, oh, this is the, this is the place where there's almost no empirical analysis and there's tons and tons of speculation. Right, so that's the gap that the first paper I'm going to talk about is trying to finish. Okay, so this is a paper about ex uh, about the, the textile manufacturers in India by a bunch of professor, bunch of people. Uh, Nick Bloom is a professor at Stanford, uh, at various places, um, and they conduct an experiment on textile manufacturers in Bombay. I'll tell you a little bit about that. What they found was actually very striking. Okay, so let me first tell you a little bit about the experiment, and then uh, we'll talk about that. So just to, you know, uh, just to reinforce what Webber said at the, end, at the beginning, um, stop me if something isn't clear, I'm very happy to have it explained. I'm going over a lot of these things relatively quickly. I'm used, so used to presenting academic audiences that I'm using, I often lapse into the language of academics, uh, which is really, you know, an entry barrier more than anything else. Uh, so stop and ask uh, if something is clear, if some term is clear. Chances are it's just sloppy language on my part and not uh, uh, something that deep. Okay, here we go. So here's what they do. They go to a bunch of these textile manufacturers, they divide them into two groups, a control group and a treatment group. Uh, they go from the treatment group and say, we we'll give you consulting to free. So they basically, the World Bank basically, with unlimited funds I'm going, uh, pays Anderson for Accenture consultant, uh, uh, Accenture's consulting fees for me uh, and uh, the, the specific firms get. So Accenture does a fairly, you know, comprehensive uh, consulting assignment, mostly about operations and mentoring. Nothing strategic. This is not about, you know, this is not strategy consulting. This is real operation consulting, shop floor production, that kind of stuff. And these are big firms. The guys who are running these firms, these are these are plants owned and operated by relatively sizable entities. Right? These aren't really small uh, fringe operations. These are actually proper companies. Uh, right? And then they compare the usual strategy, see what happens after this Right? And what they found is really striking. So these guys found a bunch of things that were problematic and they recommended. The problem was not so much that. The, the, the striking thing about that was how simple some of these things were, or how basic some of these things were. So I'll show you a couple of pictures which are meant to kind of illustrate that. Uh, so these are all taken from their paper. Um, so like one of their recommendations was very simple. They walk in, they see that inventory is a complete mess. Everything is just piled into one big storeroom. Nothing is racked, nothing is organized, nothing is solved. They tell them, no, no, you sort them, organize them, label them, uh, and so you can find things easier. Uh, this is between rocket science and this 
So something so so something so fundamental to the to the production process, and that's what that quality experience means. Then they talk about same thing with spare parts. These machines frequently came up for uh, for repairs, uh, and the spare parts were just all over the place. So Anderson or Accenture had them basically you know, organize that part of the production process, make sure that the spare parts are organized whenever you need to take uh, whenever you need to conduct a repair. You minimize the downtime. Or, or the lost production as a result. Uh, the same thing. Uh, production data was almost, you know, one of the big issues that these guys faced was quality control. Uh, so they would produce something, they would come back with it was defective, and they would spend a ton of time and resources uh, uh, dealing with defective production. Uh, so one of the things that Accenture recommended was why don't you collect data on, you know, which loom and which machine, uh, you know, is perhaps the most um, one of, of the most uh, prone to the facts, uh, and then do something. About it. So they collected. They started collecting data. Shocking! They, did, they had never, you know, they never collected anything like this. Uh, so they collected all that data, organized uh, them, discussed that, and then specifically dealt with that. So all of these things, you know, uh, were kind of rem remarkably effective. So the, all of the pictures I'm showing you are the after pictures. There were a bunch of before pictures. Uh, which were not pretty. Uh, but I think all of these are like, uh, th all of these were based on the recommendations of, uh, of these consultants. Right. And then what did they find? And, you know, perhaps not very surprisingly at this point, uh, the treatment plan saw a big increase in this productivity measure. So what the, uh, what Bloom and co authors were interested in was exactly this productivity measure. They wanted to see what happened to that A to these plans. So that's exactly what they saw. They saw a big improvement in A uh, post uh, this, this intervention. Right. And I think, so the two things. One, yes, so the idea that A can be improved with expertise is not very, really, perhaps not that surprising. What is surprising, or what was surprising to me at least, was the level at which these improvements were taking place. So these were large, quote unquote, relatively sophisticated manufacturers. You know, these are people who have been manufacturing, been doing manufacturing for many, many years, and some even for decades, some even longer, it's a big family business that's been running uh, this thing. And it's something like textiles. It's not really that technology has changed. Uh, I don't have the pictures of the looms, uh, but they have, the paper actually has a picture of a loom from the late 18th century, and the loom that's been used is basically the same thing. So nothing really has changed, and yet all of this stuff just didn't happen. Right? And, and, and to me, that was really striking. And the funny part was, and this is kind of, um, it was even more surprising. When they calculated the gains, the profits, the incremental profits from this intervention, and compared that to what Accenture's fees were, or what the consultant's fees were, the break even was like a year or two. So that's how much money was being left on the table. So this was not, you know, this is something really basic. Really fundamental to the production process, right? And this, you know, uh, and that's what these guys, uh, you know, kind of. That's the punchline of the paper. So, and, and then they kind of asked these guys. They asked the entrepreneurs, um, so why did you guys do this? You know, what was like, what was your um, thinking? Did you think about these things? You know, what, were, what were your, um, what was your thought process or something like this? And the most common answer they got. So this is a theme we keep coming back to in my talk, uh, was something about information. And they got two kinds of answers. One was kind of like no information. One was like, oh, we never even thought about this. This, this didn't even cross our mind. This wasn't even something we thought uh, was possible. Again, I want to emphasize, these are people who have decades of experience in that particular sector. So this is not something, you know, this is not a light miss uh, by its Second was a group of people who said, yeah, we kind of thought about these things, but they seem like too much work relative to them. I mean, the calculations, the experience, they're supposed to them wrong, but there's something wrong. And they said, we thought about these things, but we somehow came to the conclusion, we kind of came to the conclusion that the expected benefits from this was uh, too small, and it's not worth it. Right, so that's what, um, and that's the theme we'll keep coming back to. So that's one striking phenomenon. The message I take from this is to say, even for relatively sophisticated producers, so Bloom and others, have, they conducted this study 
um, across countries, not in this form. What they did was they would go to specifics, so they would go to, you know, um, they would go to a sector in the U.S. So a version of what I showed you in, in that in, on the on an earlier slide um, kind of shows up even in the U.S. There's a lot of heterogeneity in A within a sector in the U.S. or in Germany or in any of the developed uh, economies in this time. So part of the, the part of the puzzle is to see why does why do two firms in the same sector, in the same country, have such different A levels, right? such different levels of production? And what Bloom and um, um, his co author, Van Rien and Blue, uh, is basically a version of this management study. Yeah. But they don't really kind of do it as an experiment. They conduct a survey where they call up firms and ask them which of these management practices, which are widely regarded as good ideas, do you actually attack? And so they score, the co and then based on that, they construct a score for the quality of management that a firm. And what they find is that that score very nicely predicts the patterns in A. Firms that can have high scores on that management kind of uh, index uh, also are the ones with high levels. So, in some sense, their work is one of the few things which actually shows in a very concrete way. But if you're interested in productivity, something like management, something like this, actually makes a difference. Right, in a very aggregate sense, and I think that's quite strong. And again, I want to say, you know, if you think that this is a problem uh, at this level or at this scale, think of what it would be at a very much more point level. That the differences in these gaps are going to be even higher. So that's quest that's one uh, Okay, so that's explanation one. A second explanation which is a more subtle one, uh, but I think actually, you know, really why it became so kind of uh, fashionable. The second explanation is about uh, is that a, is that a country's average productivity could be low because it hasn't allocated its uh, inputs well. I'll tell you what I mean. So suppose there are two firms, one high, uh, one firm which is a very high A. Uh, AG, uh, and another firm with a much lower A. Okay, so now, and you have a certain amount of capital and a certain amount of labor, and you allocate this capital and labor to these two firms, and then you look at the whole at the, at the country as a whole. The average A of that country is going to be some combination of these two A's. It's going to be like basically a weighted average of these two A's, with the weights determined by how much input you need. Each of these firms, sorry, each of these firms, right? So, in some sense, how efficient you want to make, you know, the more you give to this, uh, to the, to the, to the better firm, quote unquote, uh, the more average productivity. And suppose a country messes up this allocation. For some reason, we allocate a disproportionate amount of uh, resources or inputs to uh, the less productive. That would, on average, reduce the. So, in other words, suppose there were two firms. India and the US looked exactly like this. Both of them had the same two firms uh, with the same two A levels. The only difference was the US allocated the inputs, quote unquote, efficiently, in the sense that it gave a lot more inputs to the better, to the better firm. Uh, whereas in India, that allocation was somehow less than uh, half. Right. Um, and that would, again, that's another potential source by which India has a much lower, or India ends up with a much lower A uh, than the US, right? So that's, again, this is an old idea. Actually, Banerjee and Esther Duflo wrote about this, you know, seven years ago. Other people have talked about this. This is an old idea. Uh, the reason it became so popular was because of the work of two um, economists from a few years ago. Um, who conducted, who, who kind of said, let's kind of quantify this, not at the micro level, but for the country as a whole. So they go, at least for, for a significant part of the country as a whole. So they, go, they collect data uh, from uh, you know, uh, government data sources on basically very detailed firm level data on sales, capital, labor, all, all the data that you need to do this calculation uh, for the entire manufacturing sector in India and China. And then they say, we're going to collect that data and try and quantify how big a deal uh, this is. Okay? 
Um, and so this, here's what they found. Right? So they, got, uh, sorry. they basically show, or they basically found, that this misallocation, in the sense that this inefficient allocation of inputs across uh, firms was much higher, or much worse in India and China. And not only that, suppose, you know, it's not like it's per everything is perfect in the US, by no means. There's a lot of misallocation even in the US. So it's not like, you know, the benchmark is, is you know, is perfection. Um, so what, but what they found was, if you took the misallocation in India, and just all you did, you're not going to take it all the way to the fully efficient level. You're just going to take it to the level that we study in the US. But just that reduction alone would increase India steel by as much as 60%. I mean, it's not everything. The difference between India and the US is, you know, a, a, you know, a factor of two or three, but it's still a big chunk of that. Of that. So this was a very, very influential idea. This is, again, the first paper that actually sh kind of showed that the second explanation uh, actually has bite. That this really, you know, that this is really a big part of the, of the aggregate. Right. And I think this began, this sparked off an entire uh, series of people, a series of uh, papers trying to uncover, okay, so why is this misallocation higher in India uh, than this value? What's really driving that? So there's a lot of work uh, on that uh, on that side. Okay, the World Bank um, replicated this methodology for a bunch of countries. And they found exactly the same pattern. That countries, that developing countries in general, screwed up the their allocation of resources uh, of inputs across. The so it's not like it, it's not like the set of production possibilities are that different. It's just that you know somehow these countries are unable to take a full advantage of that of that potential because the resources are somehow allocated inefficient. And again, people did this with agriculture. Agriculture is really, really spiky. They would go, you know, um, I saw this paper by, uh, I think it was Sadeghi Mali. You go to a village, they look at a farm, look at how farmer, you know, uh, how land is allocated across farms. You find the same thing. There are some farmers who are just systematically better at turning, you know, at, at generating iron. Yet, they don't really have. The, uh, the amount of land that's commensurated there. They have a very, you know, they have much smaller uh, areas of land under their control than what you would expect given how productive. If anything, the more micro you go, the more striking is this misallocation. Uh, but it's there everywhere. Uh, some of my own work is in thinking about this misallocation for among publicly traded funds. Large well-funded, you know, large institutions, uh, large companies in India also have the same extent, or not the same, but similar extent. So it's a, it's a deeper problem, but it's a problem that's pervasive. It actually seems to be there everywhere, across the entire time span. And that's very, very spiky. Sorry. How much of that is, has been traced back to capital markets? Okay. Excellent question. That's exactly what yeah. so that's So this is just saying that this misallocation is big. Right? That this misallocation matters. Now we ask the question, what, what's driving this misallocation? What could be driving this misallocation? Right? So I'm going to talk about two categories of things. Right? The first, in a self-serving way, is going to be my own paper. Um, the first is a very simple explanation. Now that's what we do in this paper. And again, like I said, we actually look at public funds. These are large funds, and we do it exactly for the reason you mentioned. We want to kind of take away, you know, issues like, oh, are uh, these guys credit constrained? Don't they get funding? We want to kind of strip away all of that. So we're going to compare the universe of public firms in India to their counterparts in the US. They are much more comparable than the universe of firms in India uh, to the firms in the US. Right? And again, we find you know, and I'll tell you what, so that the explanation we find most compelling for this set of firms is what I'm going to call information frictions. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So, I have one Sorry. question. Yeah. Uh, just being speaking of capital point of view. Yeah. When, when you were like talking about capital, mm -hmm. were you talking about capital which is invested by a business? 
yes. or which is also available in general in the country. For example, in my office I might, I might have multiple security guards. If I have full confidence of the security situation in the country, mm -hmm. I do not have to invest resources. So it's not necessarily my capital, but the capital in general infused by the country. Mm -hmm. Which allows me to allocate my resources much better. Right. So you know, um, so in let me kind of let me be specific about at least in this context, I can be very specific about that. Mm -hmm. This misallocation stuff is really much sharper than that. It just says, you know, I'm going to look at how much capital is available for production. Right. So I'm talking about you know um, factories. So think about one sector, like a manufacturing sector. Think about the aggregate amount of capital available in that sector. Hold that fixed and just focus on how that's allocated among different firms in that sector. And that's what this part is. Like, you know, maybe on app, you know, maybe the aggregate amount of capital available to that sector itself is too low or too high. This kind of steps back from that and says, okay, I'm not worried about that. I'm just trying to see, given the amount of capital, how do you want to allocate it? Right, so I think that's the thought experiment um, here. So the other issue which you brought up is also an important one, which is basically maybe some of this capital is being spent on activities that are necessary in a particular country, but completely unnecessary in other countries. Yeah. Right, right, right. That's exactly, yeah. So there's some of that stuff too. That's a little bit more in the it will show up in the first category of explanations rather than the misallocation stuff. So the misallocation stuff is a little bit cleaner that way. Because it really just focuses on saying, I'm not, I, I, you know, this is not a statement about whether you have too much or too little capital. Right? Like for example, a hotel in the US does not have a power plant. Whereas, you know, in India it might have a power plant. Right? So that, this is, this is not about that. This is just saying, let's see how much capital they have. And let's see if we are giving that capital to the most effective producer in that sector. So the, the only extension I was making was if you have efficient way of this does it make the issue of scale slightly different? Because effectively then some of the investments that I make in mm -hmm. just making sure that my business run, I can just take it from my own sources. But if the fact that I need to run utilities means that I need to definitely run a larger business as compared to a small business. Uh, that's a good point, that there may be other reasons why, you know, but in some sense, the problem, as you see, um, is not, so, yeah, so let's think about that experiment, that, that question, the following, this is saying, there's something in the external environment that says all firms in the sector have an incentive to be there. right, so that's, that's the, uh, that's the indication of what you're talking about. But again, what this is doing is not even that, this is just saying, you know, there are, okay, so all of them are bigger than their counterparts in the US. So that whole distribution is basically shifted, let's say, to the right. The question these guys are trying to answer is to say, you know, take the most efficient guy there, you know, and look at, just some, just look at the relative size of different people in that sector. So even if everybody has an incentive to be bigger, you could still say the guy who's really productive must be really big. Whereas a guy who's really inefficient should be really small. So like for example in China, a big deal is state-owned enterprises are really big. If you actually look at their efficiency indicators, they are really poor. So in some sense, there's a sense in which those guys have much more capital and resources than is commensurate with their efficiency. Even if there are other things, you, the country stands to gain by taking resources away from them and giving it to a more efficient and so that's the thought experiment uh, this is so, Okay, um, so, so one thing we find, and I think I want to quickly touch on this because this comes back to the idea of information uh, that we saw earlier. So, so I kind of, you know, and this goes back a little bit to your question. Uh, so I kind of made it look too easy, say, there is uh, two firms, one firm is a higher rate than the other. We know it's very easy to say who should get more resources in practice, obviously, you know, firms operate in a very dynamic environment. Most of the time, it's not that they're making decisions based on what's happening to them now. Most of the time, they're making decisions based on what they think will happen. And so they have to make projections about the economic environment they will be in uh, over some horizon 
uh, and then make decisions accordingly. So that that creates a kind of uncertainty uh, in this in this process. So if you thought that firms in India operated in a more uncertain environment, you can kind of see that that by itself would lead to factors being misallocated. In other words, firms have to make some assessment. Um, you know, they make some uh, hiring and some some investment decisions based on their assessment of the future. You know, the economic environment is much more uncertain. So, exposed, somebody might have had too much capital. Somebody would have had too little. Um, and it turns out, and that's exactly what we find in our, in our analysis, it turns out that this extent of this uncertainty is much higher in India than in, than, than in the US and China. So in other words, firms uh, in India and China are making investment decisions or hiring decisions under a lot less, uh, or under much tighter informational constraints than, uh, than their counterparts in the US. And I think that's one source of misallocation um, that we try to focus on. And we quantify that, and that turns out to be quite big as well. I want to come back to the other, to this point, which you raised earlier. The, the other kind of natural thing a lot of people brought up, uh, thought about, was credit. And the and I thought of credit is very simple. It says this A firm, this higher A firm, is constrained by funding. So it should have a lot more capital, it should have a lot more of this thing. But it can't raise funding, so it's artificially smaller than its kind of its, its optimal size. That's a very intuitive, very appealing, you know, uh, channel. And it's appealing, it's intuitive for you know for obvious reasons, also very appealing. This is almost looks like, oh we know, we can fix that problem. We know what 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 kind of things. The, the other thing I told you about oh, all uh, a more uncertain economic environment is a little bit you know, unsatisfactory because it's not clear what you can do. Right? It's not clear how the government or how anybody can make things better off if they make uh, make that uncertainty go away. Maybe the washing machine industry in, in, in India is doomed to be much more uncertain than uh, its counterpart in the US for forever. Right? So it's not clear what exactly that means. Well, something like credit is a lot more tangible and a lot more kind of seems actionable. Seems like something we can change. We can do something. About. That's, that's why credit was really appealing. So there's a lot of guys. You know, there's a lot of work trying to explore this credit channel of this application. Okay, and but unfortunately, it didn't work. I tell you, I mean, conceptually it worked, but the evidence just didn't support that. Either across countries. And within kind of you know looking at variations, what happens to the same countries? So this is work by one of my colleagues. Uh, they used data from Korea, maybe Colombia, uh, and looked at a bunch of kind of top experiments, a uh, bunch of ways, a bunch of other countries. To them. It turns out that if you look at different countries where the quality of financial kind of uh, markets is very very different, that did almost nothing to predict the extent of this happening. The credit seemed to be less of a problem. And similarly, the example I gave you earlier, in our work, the things we looked, the firms we looked at are these large public firms. Um, they whatever is the underlying credit environment, they are much less likely to be constrained by funding. And even there, there was a large disparity in this, in this misallocation, the efficiency of this allocation. That's what makes this kind of the credit channel, while it was very kind of appealing really did not give us, uh, did not lead to a very satisfactory answer um, that at the end of the day. Has, has there been similar research done on financial institutions where the input is capital? So, for, yeah. uh, because it's, it's slightly different and... Um, and uh, the short answer is no. The reason yeah. people haven't done that is because, you know, the, the ability to quantify this rests on our ability to have to specify a simple kind of production function. And in financial institutions, that's always been a big problem. It's unclear how to map something like capital or funding or assets or loans into value added for a financial institution. So much of this work tries to go, you know, really narrow into sectors where we, in other words, you know, can I compare SBI to you know Goldman Sachs or Citibank. 
it's not clear that they are even, you know, that, 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 the, that the suite of things they are doing, um, you know, allows for a fair comparison or allows for a meaningful comparison of say, is Citibank too small in India relative to its efficiency relative to SPI? That's a hard question to answer because we don't know how to describe or we don't have a lot of confidence in describing the production process of a bank. So these guys, this literature at least has focused on manufacturing where we can do that with a little more confidence. But I think, you know, the most people, I think my own hunches, the misallocation in cross financial institutions is just as bad, probably even worse than, uh, than in something like manufacturing. But I don't think there have been much. Back to that is no question. No. I think that's not been studied that much. Maybe a little bit, but nothing on this guy. Nothing with this. These guys actually have numbers. Uh, nothing, I don't think, uh, comparable in terms of financial institutions. At least not as far as I know. Yeah. Just have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to mind about the Sure. So, is it just in fact, Idiosyncratic at the level of the industry or at the level of the top? At the top, sure. Okay. And aggregate to the level of the industry. Uh huh. Um, I'm assuming uh, our industry is more likely to invest in more resources towards the industry. Sure. Yes, yes, yes. If that is actually the strength, how can you actually put that in or answer to why there's so much of this allocation in the cost of the problems? No, but that's precisely what this is saying. It's saying, you know, there is a lot of idiosyncratic variation. Some firms just have better products, some have more popular things. They should get a lot of resources. And the puzzling thing is they don't. So, so my question was on what should I get factor? So, uh, how do we ensure? Yeah, but, you know, but in some sense, the challenge of saying how do we ensure an optimal allocation of factors rests on us figuring out why the factor allocation is messed up in the first place. Like in the example I gave you, it might be that you know these idiosyncratic things are very, very hard to forecast. Right? Then maybe we just throw up our hands and say, well, there's nothing much we can do about this because we're never going to be in a position to have real-time, very precise estimates on these idiosyncratic conditions and therefore we Whereas if it's something like credit, we could have said, okay, maybe we need a lot of financial market reforms, which will help these more efficient guys get more of this capital. Right, so that, that's the sense in which this is stuck. I think this is missing one back. Right, so that's precisely what this literature is trying to do. The research here is trying to uncover what at the micro level is screwing up this allocation, and then we can start thinking about that. So I didn't speak about the others, but a big chunk of this is government regulation. Like, for example, the most direct one are, you know, <coughs> India for a long time, even now, has policies which are explicitly aimed at keeping, you know, at propping up small, somewhat inefficient producers. And it creates incentives for small guys to stay, you know, in business and actually have resources, even when their efficiency is not There are other motivations for doing that, but that's that's part of the story of this misallocation. Right? So that's exactly that. And then there are issues like this, uh, what you brought up, maybe there are technological limitations. Maybe, you know, we can't pay, but the big, maybe the big firm is as big as it should get. There's no point giving him more capital because that firm is not going to be able to use that capital. Right? So there are, you know, so it's, it's precisely, you know, the, the lesson we learn from this is that this thing is big. Not just at the level of the country, in, you know, in an absolute sense, but also across countries. Like this problem is much worse in India and China than in the US. So the day, the day, the name of the game is to see what's different about the underlying environment that's leading to this disparity. And then we can try and see if we can fix that. And so that's what that's what we're, you know that's the game. Yeah. Okay. So here's something I want to come back. To. I know I, I promised you I'll talk about microfinance, and that's exactly what. Uh, so this question, this finding here, this idea that credit really did not play a big role. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'll skip the question of this like, uh, Is there evidence on the other big financing channel, which is equity? Or the so 
Simple as yeah, that's a good question. The way to think about the financing channel here is in a very kind of, you know, um, as something which encapsulates all that. It's to say, you know, that what's the thought experiment? It's a very simple one. I'd right? say, I am a high A firm. I'd like to grow to a certain scale to mensurate that. I can't grow because I can't raise capital. I can't raise capital because I don't have access to equity or because I don't have access to bank financing. I don't have access to that. That's the, that's the sense in which, at, and even at that level, we couldn't find any, you know, any links between financial market development or financial market type of indicators and, and, and this application. Okay, so, but then one kind of, one branch of this, uh, of this literature said, okay, Maybe this credit thing, even how we're doing it is, you know, maybe this is a problem, because maybe the, these things is because we're looking at the wrong set of firms. Maybe this is a big deal for smaller firms, but not at all a big deal for the large ones. Right. So if you're comparing, you know, is Orion's too big or too small, finance is nothing to do. Orion's might be too big or too small for completely different reasons than to see if there's some small producer uh, who's kind of constrained by this. It was a big, then so the uh, kind of a branch of this literature went in the direction of saying, why don't we start looking at what's happening? And remember I told you that this misallocation is pervasive. It's there at the level of the farmer. And clearly at the level of the farmer, then it constrains other people. Right? So then say, okay, maybe there we can find a role for uh, credit type of uh, credit type uh, interventions. So that was one, that's where the microfinance literature went with this misallocation. Okay, so let me kind of briefly touch upon that, and I'll, then I'll take uh, then I'll take questions. Right, so this stuff. Um, so Chris Udry, who's a professor at Yale, um, this is from a talk he gave a few years ago, uh, where he was summarizing basically uh, the the learnings from a bunch of experiments uh, across countries, across contexts, and across programs. You know, some of these were you know so. What are, all, what are all of these programs trying to do? They identify a group of people, uh, a group of uh, firms, people, what have you, um, split them into two groups. To one of the groups, basically implement a program. You know, a program could be as simple as just handing out money. Uh, and the thought experiment is this. It's like, it, it, if it is the case that you have a great idea, you have a positive net present value project, Works. And the only reason we are not doing it is because you don't have money. So let's see if we can kind of just give you money and see if we get positive and we need on that. So that's one kind of uh, way. A, a bunch of them were more kind of traditional or conventional microfinance uh, initiatives. So they were actually grant law. The first time was just giving the money, these like grants. They would just give them money with no repayment. The fun experiment was you had a great idea, I just gave you money, I'm hoping you'll do this. But let's see what you do. Right? And then the, the others were the traditional microfinance things, which were actually the Right? So that's what Udri kind of collects the, uh, this from. I'll give you a few examples here, and then, uh, I'll then summarize them. So some of the most celebrated ones in India were you know, medium sized firms in Hyderabad. Um, then they did a bunch of stuff with households in Thailand. Thailand has fantastic data uh, for all this stuff. There was, you know, there was an experiment with tailors in Ghana. Um, so this, is, this is the classic thing, right? You know, this guy needs money to buy a new machine. He doesn't have money. Let's give him money, let's see what he does. Hope is to see, does he actually invest in this machine? And two, you know, does this actually give him a heart? So I want to be careful about the, top, the, the, the goal here. The goal, you know, microfinance is, is useful for a whole host of reasons. These are people, you know, most of the time the target audience or the, the, the target customer base are people who are excluded from the financial system in a, in a significant way. So almost anything you do is making them better off. The question these guys are after is not whether you're making them better off. The question is, are you actually, you know, enabling them to move to a higher trajectory economic outcomes? That's the notion of this day. Are you actually is this is this actually unleashing some untapped potential in the country? Or is this just a way of redistributing these things? We could say, you know, we have to do this because these are people who are otherwise marginalized by the tax system, by the by traditional you know uh, 
by the, by the absence of a social security net, so we may want to do this. The question here is something about shock, it's saying, is this actually something that can help us you know, uh, in the long run? Is this actually going to help drag these people out of their, their, their bioeconomic space? That's the question. That we have. Right. And then they do you know, kind of more interesting experiments, like some of them involve uh, grants and training. So, you know, they give grants and they give them basic business training. A little bit of marketing, a little bit of accounting, a little bit of customer service. The basic stuff, they said, okay, let's see if that happens. Right? So, they, you know, there's a whole bunch of that. Then there are experiments which involve uh, insurance. They say, you know, the problem may not be money. These guys have the resources to make the gamble. It's just that it's a big gamble. If it fails, they stop. So let's see if we can just take that out of the picture. So what they did in India was rainfall insurance. That's a simple idea. It's amazing it hasn't been done before. It just basically got a bunch of people. In some of them, they sold them insurance. In some cases, they just gave them insurance against rainfall. Right? So there's nothing, you know, it doesn't even have moral hazard type of problem. It's literally, you know, better, better insurance. Right? And they said, okay, let's see what they do. In China, they did something more interesting. Uh, they were talking about high yielding varieties of crops. You know, and the question was to say, oh, these guys, these guys didn't want to, even if you pay Monsanto an arm and a leg for the seeds, they didn't want to take this investment given how risky it was. Uh, and so they gave them crop insurance. They said, why don't you try this and we'll ensure you against the cost. And then the, the thought experiment was to see, do these guys do the things that you know, that raise their income levels from so across, across all of this, the thought experiment is, does this change their income levels uh, per It makes them better off for a whole bunch of reasons, but does it actually change what they do, change what they, what they make? So, how do you have a... Sorry. Go ahead. How do you have a, in the last experiment, an increase in sort of risk taking, but not from... Yeah, so it's going to, okay, it's going to come into that. So let me explain that. I have a connected point. Yeah, sure. Why was there an anticipation of increased profits? Because if, if insurance is priced at actually fair numbers, then what you would expect is only increase in the state, and not increase in profits, because effectively you're pricing it to the level of the average risk that you're going to face. Oh, so it's not profits of the insurer. No, but it's profits of the customer. Yeah, yeah. So no. if I am pricing my So here's the thought experiment, right? It's like saying there is here's the here's the here's the, the idea. There are two varieties of seeds. There's a low yield variety and there's a high yield variety. So the high yield variety is risky. Okay? So there's some risk, let's say the low yield variety gives you a low yield for sure. Right? So in other words, if um, you price the high if you price the insurance of the high yield fairly, then you know it's as if so it's, uh, let me give you a you know um, um, uh, kind of number, right? Let's say suppose the low yield gave you 1% for sure. The high yield gives you 8% on average, but it's risky. Because you hate risk, you never took the 8%. Now I give you actually fair insurance, which means now you basically earn 8%. You have the chance to earn 8%. So all is equal, I should achieve you earn 8%. Because I've taken risk out of the picture for you. And it's precisely because it's actually fair. Because if it wasn't actually fair, it could be that the insurance company is eating the, the gains. Right? So that was the part expected. But surprise, surprise, they found this. And that, you know, this was very puzzling. Um, they don't have a good explanation, but they have some some kind of indications of what could be going on. Here's here are a couple. One is to say, you know, it's not that you just buy this high yielding variety of seed, crop it into the ground, and then walk away. There are a bunch of other things you need to do. So one possibility is that by providing them with insurance, or maybe sufficiently generous insurance, it took away their incentives to tend to those high yielding crops in a way that minimized the risk. Right. So in other words, this eight percent number I was giving you, you know, maybe required them to pay a certain attention in a situation where I, I completely take risk out of the picture. You don't do the things that are necessary to get them. Maybe you tend them differently, you water them differently. Maybe you have to put, you know, other inputs in there which are not observed. So in some sense, insurance also maybe 
in, in a sense, interacts with the yield of that of that uh, particular investment. And so that's one explanation, one potential explanation. The second is again goes back to this theme of information. It's it's possible that for a lot of these farmers, they just didn't know how to optimally extract the yield from this high yield variety. It may be required, you know, a set of other complementary inputs, which they were just not aware of. So in some sense, they, they made the risk. It's like saying, I took on this riskier thing, but I didn't do it right. Right, again, speaks to this idea that, you know, that's what this training thing is motivated by. This training thing was motivated by the idea that maybe these guys, the problem is not human capital, the problem is not financial capital, the problem is at some level human capital. The idea that they don't have the where the all the resources, the knowledge, the know-how to undertake these kind of profit problems. And that's precisely what this training thing was uh, meant to. And that experiment also had like you know very interesting results. They found that men who got the grants and the training, they you know actually ended up taking, you know, making riskier investments, ended up taking some risky investments and ended up getting higher incomes. So it's not clear. So, so the theme that comes out of all of this is that the evidence is really mixed. It seems to, you know, at least one thing seems to come out of this is how Ubri describes the this thing. Ubri says at best the evidence about a simple credit being the primary constraint is very mixed. So I think why that was you know, why he phrased it like that and why that's important for Credit at some level is the easiest problem to fix. In terms of scaling, all of those other things, you really have to figure out what goes into uh, making a high yielding variety of a crop a high yielding variety, or what makes for a successful tailor shop business in Accra. Those are really, really detail oriented, context specific policies. So, the, the kind of the negative result here, you know, that one seems to come out from this is that there is no there is no way out that you have to engage with that with that context in a, in a fairly detailed way. If this if this was if this was so you know that includes uh, you know some combination of management and training, but also in a very sophisticated way, understanding the role of risk. And insurance, and exactly how to deliver that insurance, how to set up that that how to design a product for a context uh, is going to be really hard. But it's really important. It's hard, but it's really important. And that's basically the message that Udri draws from this. He uh, says all of the things we thought were important are important. What we find a little bit, you know, what we find um, less evidence for is that this is a problem. Which is going to go away if we throw money at it. That's not, you know, throwing money at this might make these guys better off because they're getting the money, which is good. But it's not, it's not basically, um, uh, it's not enough to give them the, the economic opportunities that we think are important for them. So that's kind of what the development literature has been, has been kind of. Uh, uh, you know, st struggling with it to some extent. It's to figure out exactly how do we go about this now? How do we go about trying to, you know, build um, scalable models that we can take to different contexts? Suppose I told you training did wonders for tailors in Ghana. What does that tell you about you know, uh, auto drivers and the outskirts of that? That's the kind of issue. But I think, but in some sense, what this literature is telling us is that that really matters. But there's no way you can get away from it. And to go back to what I started out in the beginning, given how large the problems we saw in something like, you know, how large the um, the disparities in information, even at relatively, even among relatively sophisticated firms, this should come as no surprise. That at the at the micro level, there's much more complicated frictions at work uh, that we. We need a lot more uh, work in terms of understanding. Uh, yeah. One we have sort of with this evidence base sure. is that you know when you say credit at the micro level, a lot of what has been measured is fairly standardized credit contracts. 
So part of our work, we tell him all about that later, which is tell us how I told you. It's about thinking about potential for much more tailored credit at scale at the micro level, uh, which might still not go into training and business uh, inputs and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But a credit contract that responds much more to you are an agricultural laborer, you are a shopkeeper, you are, you know, it's, it could be very different. And a lot of evaluations have been on standardized credit contracts. No, no, but I, 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 you know, I'm actually, I think what you're doing is exactly consistent with the learning from this exercise. The, the standardization, well, if you're saying the standardization was partly, you know, part of the reason why they did this, you know, uh, why, why these guys focus on standardization was precisely because scalability was much easier, right? And this word is the saying is, okay, that's not the most profitable direction to go. You need to figure out how to pay that stuff. In fact, you know, one of the, I, I don't have that line from Woodbridge thing because this heterogeneity is key. That's that's everywhere we look, the heterogeneity matters a lot. Even in that Esther Duflo, the, the hyperbaric experiment, there are huge variation in uh, who succeeded from that and who did not. So you kind of tell, you know, so I think in a sense what you're doing is maybe anticipating, you know, the direction this literature is going, in terms of what kind of things you want to do. That's both, I mean, I'm saying it's both um, encouraging and discouraging. It's encouraging because it says, okay, we're making progress, we can actually do something. The discouraging part is how do we take this, you know, how do we draw general lessons from this? Right? And that's what's, I think, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of a population in the way we're talking about different things. So I just want sure, to sure, yeah. So just when you spoke about the uh, Esther's work in actual parts. So there we see a lot more equity. What we're saying is that you see some people are able to see the use credit better than the others. So the argument we're making based on the evidence is that we should provide better credit to the ones that are actually not credit. But similarly, when you talk about. Uh, okay, that's not what I was. I mean, I don't know if that's what they wanted to do. generally what people say. No, that's not what I mean. I, I meant something much simpler. I'm just saying when you do these stands, when you roll out the standardized credit for that, right? A lot of people are going to take out that part with some reason. You know, uh, part of the reason the results from these experiments are inconclusive is precisely because, you know, you're kind of uh, trying to get all of this. Among the people who take out that part, there's a lot of variation, a lot of that is made. Uh, and because the product you offer hasn't been tailored to that kind of thing, you're, 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 you're biased to only. Yeah, it's not productivity. No, because what I was doing, you know, some extent it is because some of the evidence from the paper was that people who already had like a lot of the people who are seeing it. So then I'm not sure if it's productive. It has something to do with it. Yeah, it's not. If you don't like your message. In a sense, if it was productivity, then we know how to fix the problem. In other words, if you could look at a pool of all of us, we could identify this guy is productive, this guy is less productive, this guy is better. Then we are off to the races. That's easy. The trouble I think is to say, you know, is there a way we can design a product which actually respects the fact that we are not going really to know a whole lot about these models? Right? So we, we can only condition on some things. Like I said, we can even be able to condition on have you been a shopkeeper for a long time? Maybe you can offer that guy a different product versus some guy who has been driving an auto and now wants to open a store. Maybe the product you want to give him is different from the product you want to give a shop a, shop, a shopkeeper who's opening his full store. That's the kind of heterogeneity. Maybe the shop people, the auto driver point shop people, is the more productive one. But without any kind of, without our ability to know that example, how do we design a product? So, are there, is there work that's looked at the heterogeneity in productivity? So, in the TFP? Uh, when you say looked at, what do you mean? Uh, in the session? Yeah, in measurement. It's the same way that you have an average treatment effective microbiome. Right. Find that so all the, the earlier stuff, not, not on the microfinance level, at the aggregate level, there's tons of work. So that the Mitch Moon stuff was telling you exactly that. So the factors other than KML. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what they do, in, what they do is in, a, in, a, in their management practices paper, what they do is basically this. You know, and this is, in the US it's done, you know, actually very, very convincingly almost. Because they take industries where, you know, there's almost zero variation in technology. Like an economic example is dry ice. It's a very, very standard product. Everybody uses the same damn technology. Everybody, it's the same product. 
there you see a huge variation in X. A huge, you know, very large variation in X. And then they try to understand why is there so much variation in X. There they do stuff like, okay, do these firms follow, maybe the firms with high A's actually do manage the practice, its inventory control is better. You know, maybe they have better information flow within the firm. All of that stuff seems to make a big difference in explaining that. It doesn't explain why the low guys just don't switch and do the right thing. But that's what, I, you know, that's what, the, you know, that's what the, the, the first experiment, the first paper was trying to say. When you talk to these guys, they don't know. They don't know how much money they're making. Does it also make a case for an intervention? And would you, like, for example, uh, when you spoke about the architecture, yeah, exactly. yeah, does that count as an input? Sorry, does that count does as an input? Count as an input? It does. So rather than move resources away from what you're coming for, right. can you give them a certain kind of input that is optionality? No, absolutely. I think, so the way I want to think about those two things is there are two complementary reasons for low A. One is to say, you know, there's low A because you're mismanaging the existing inputs. So maybe there are some interventions which can fix that, you know, just kind of raise the level of A for everyone in the whole set. That's one option. The misallocation stuff says, taking the A's as given, can we allocate, you know, resources efficiently? I think both are part of the problem. Right? And, you know, if I had to guess, I'd say the former is a much bigger thing than the latter. But it turns out that the latter is also really big. But I think the latter says, you know, let's assume we have kind of optimized everything we can do with respect to A. Like, we've kind of, you know, we take the A's as given. But this part of the A's is coming from stuff like you have a better product than I have. And there's only so much I can That's why I'm saying the dry ice type of examples are good because then you kill them. Right? You know, otherwise I'm saying you have a slightly you are you're, you're better at you're you know you're a better chef than I am. Your restaurant is always going to have better A than I. Because that's something which is inbuilt and embodied in the in the, uh, in the inputs in a way that I can't uh, a management cannot change that. Right? So then the question is, given how good a chef you are relative to me, do you have a sufficiently large you know, restaurant operation? Right? I think that's the misapplication. Uh, and then, you know, it's a different set of things. It's saying, are you credit constrained? Are you constrained by something else? And that's the part it's done. So I think they are both complementary approaches. Uh, and the essential thing, you know, to me is saying it's crying out for an intervention. So I had dinner last night with a friend of mine who works for Sequoia, um, and he was telling me he had exactly the same experience with uh, a portfolio company uh, they manage. And he said, you know, the same thing. He said it, it was kind of striking. He said they used exactly the same words. He said the, the CEO of the company, you know, thought he was. God's gift to mankind when it came to manufacturing. And then it took him a while to say, no, 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 let's bring KPMG in, let's actually have them look at your production process and re-optimize. And he said, they re-optimized it, the break even was six months. So it cost them an arm and a leg, but they made that money back in six months. But it kind of tells you that, you know, that it's not, it's hard to say, what's, so why didn't this guy do this? Like, you know, what was, you know, like what's what's holding you back? And then that's what's really and, and my point is if we can't explain what's holding this guy back, this guy runs a 750 core company. If we can't understand what's holding him back, you know, think about the challenges of trying to understand what's holding, you know, um, a small shop. So I mean that's that's what I, that's why I kind of like the, the, the bloom thing of saying let's try and break down at least uh, you know, what happens at that level, maybe that will teach us something about what happens at this level. But I think this study is by, you know, the, the survey by Woodbury basically tells us that those type of issues have a big, have a, have a big bite uh, here as well. And the reason I'm kind of, you know, because in some sense, the conventional wisdom was, and the, that's the way I ordered my talk, this was always kind of, this is what led to what's called a macro development literature and a micro development. People thought that there was a bunch of issues that applied to macro big guys. You know, like you know, eighty percent of the value added of the country is by big guys. The bunch of issues that we need to think about for them, there's a the government regulation like that, and this, a whole bunch of things. And a completely different set of issues applies to the small guys. 
right? Um, and I think that's been the, and that's why the literature has kind of gone in that direction. You have a bunch of people working in very, very tightly defined micro contexts, conducting trials, experiments, what have you. Uh, and then you have the macro guys looking at very aggregate data and speculating about you know, uh, productivity differences. What all this work is telling us is that when you, when you actually go down to the data and look at this thing, they're actually much closer to each other than you think. The same frictions seem to be relevant uh, for big, large firms as they are in the very micro stuff. The, the scale of the problem might be different, but at some conceptual level, the challenges, that, you know, the difference between training, business training, and that consulting thing is of degree darker uh, than uh, so I think that's the message uh, his eyebrow from something from these studies. Any more? This is a related point. Yeah. Often when you see, sort of think about what's pulling a small guy back to this your language, or why is a small guy leaving the the table? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, why isn't he refinancing that is obviously expensive loan? Correct. Yeah. Or why you, you know, uh, Owning an asset when you should be like uh, There's a lot of behavioral explanations. Are you seeing, is there a similar like that we for firms? You see what I'm saying? Right? This thing about this, the, the, the 750 crore guy leaving money on the table, yeah. it's just this behavioral of that. Yeah. yeah but in, so, in explanations of productivity, is there a behavioral theory of firms? I, I struggle with behavioral theories because in some sense, I, 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 let me put this way. I think behavioral theories are descriptive, they're seldom explanations. So, in a sense, the same, I can use behavioral language to explain the, the Bloom study, and I can use that to explain the microfinance funds. But I'm explaining it only in the sense that I'm saying, yeah, they do this because they, you know, they are they're shutting themselves off to certain possibilities. It doesn't give us, you know, I struggle with it because it doesn't give us what do you do? Is this like a is this something that's amenable to policy? Is this something that's amenable to intervention? You know, um, or is this or is this and then we tread into this shady area of paternalism saying, you know, we can see what's good for you, but you can't. Uh, and I think, you know, for very, very simple decisions like you said, refinancing an identical loan for X to Y, uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff maybe it's easier to do. But even there, you know, it's actually quite remarkable in the US. Um, so some of my own work, uh, some of my other work which is related to development is about thinking about um, competition. So if you look at the health insurance market in the US, um, it's sold through websites now. You know, the extent of um, suboptimal behavior by customers is huge. You know, they systematically buy more expensive policies uh, than, and this is a, these are not small sums of money, these are sophisticated systems. What for this? Look at my own experience, I'm sure you'll find that I'm not optimizing my my, uh, my health insurance question. But is it, I mean, I, I struggle with this, describing this in the language of behavior and thing, because in some sense, you know, it's not telling us what the friction is. Like if somebody comes to me and tells me, oh, no, no, clearly you you know you should buy this policy instead of that policy, and tells me why, I switch to you know, I switch immediately. But why I haven't done it on my own could be, you know, simply because I haven't had time. I have other things to focus on, and I just didn't realize. So in other words, I don't even know how large the gap is still I'm looking at. So if I don't think the gap is large, I'm not even going to look at it. So is that behavioral? But is that actually a friction? Uh, because it's costly for me to pay attention to these things. So that's where I think I struggle a little bit with the micro at least, you know, even um, people like Esther Duflo were really out there uh, in terms of methodological uh, issues, you know, tread the behavioral line very, very carefully. I think it's a hard thing to, uh, to, to process uh, uh, for us as a colleague. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So far, we discussed at a firm there, at a huge level. Kind of take it back to a larger level. We say that the 
source allocation uh, at an economic level. And uh, I think that's how we started. And if we test the point as well, that if the source allocation is given by uh, directly or indirectly uh, by social allocation. So, for example, for a government has been through sure. social allocation, direct or indirectly. And for social welfare or for ensuring social justice, if, it, if this allocation is uh, insufficient, mm -hmm. so how do we, how do we see that? So that is the then the control is not in the hand of uh, of the individual. And so that is one part. Uh, second that is it's the social injustice or social welfare. Then so we discussed that credit that uh, significant with uh, evidence is not significant that the credit would help increasing the productivity. Mm -hmm. But can credit help address the social welfare part so that the social allocation can be efficient? Also it's not just credit but so I put it okay. I put it differently. I'd say so. There is there's one interpretation of misallocation, uh, you know, which is consistent with that thing we're getting at, which is to say um, um, sometimes it's easier to conduct redistribution uh, by legislating the, the the allocation of resources. A canonical example is small scale industries in India. I mean, you know. Maybe at some point in the past, you know, people had this crazy dream that these guys are going to be the new productive you know, uh, thing like that. But I think now the only reason those uh, rules stay on the books is because you know there's a redistributive aspect. So this, you know, it's hard to take away money from, the, from small, uh, from small uh, uh, firms uh, to the benefit of that. So what this then tells us. Is it tells us in some sense what's the other cost of this misallocation? It's like saying, you know, are the redistributive gains sufficient to um, to to, like said, to pay for a sixty percent drop? In the income that this it says that's how much you how much value you are destroying to achieve these social. Maybe that can tell us because ideally what we would like to do is to say, you know, what's the what's the the, the, the the first best word would be to say we maximize the share of the pie and then we kind of fight about how to share. I mean, we can, those are two separate things. We could say no matter what we, how we think the pie should be shared, we all should work together to maximize the size of the pie, and then we can all figure out how best we This is saying we're not doing that right. And it tells us how, to what extent we are not doing that. So then it at least opens up that conversation to say, okay, suppose we think that protectionist policies for small scale firms are necessary because of redistributive reasons. Um, this tells us, okay, this is how much value you're destroying. Now we can see, is there a way we can get it? Uh, and the last point you made, I think, I think it's general truth. It may be that. There may be more complicated interactions, like you know, maybe um, including or expanding the access of financial services influences people's decisions in a much more complicated way than we have captured. A good example is, you know, maybe by relaxing constraints, nothing happens to the to the to the individual's income, but maybe it makes it more likely that his kids go to school. That itself might be might pay for itself in a generation. Nothing like that is captured in these studies. So maybe we just have the wrong horizon when we are thinking about what stuff like this is going to be. In other words, by bringing these people into quote unquote the broader economic system, we may realize longer term potentials, even if it doesn't show up in immediate investments in, you know, in DFP. So I that I think an open question. We don't have data to answer that, uh, but hopefully that's you know, that's something we slowly learn. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh,